All right, so good evening to all and welcome to the Cambridge University Scientific Society. So my name is Bram and together with Krishna, we are the co-presidents of SciSoc. Now, before we begin, I just I would just like to make a few housekeeping announcements. May I request everyone to kindly mute your microphones and save your questions to the Q&A session at the end of the lecture. Um, in addition, we are recording this lecture and we will be uploading it onto our YouTube channel. So I kindly seek the consent of everyone here. So today is actually our second astronomy talk this term. And previously we've had Professor Sir James Huff to share about gravitational wave research in his talk, Ripples from the Dark Side of the Universe. So, and this time we are very honored to have re a renowned cosmologist from the University of Barcelona, Professor Lisha Verde. And by a sheer coincidence, her talk is actually called Observing the Light of the Distant Universe. So she will be bringing us out of the dark side and into the light. So <laughs> Professor Lisha Verde is an Italian cosmologist and a theoretical physicist. She's currently ICREA, a um, professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Barcelona. And her research interests include, dark, include large scale structures, dark energy, inflation, and the cosmic microwave background. She received a laureate degree from the, in 1996 from the University of Padua and a PhD in 2000 from the University of Edinburgh. She did her postdoctoral study at Princeton University and joined the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania in, 20, in 2003. From 2007, Prof. Rady became ICREA professor at the Institute of Cosmo Science of the University of Barcelona. And she was also professor too at the University of Oslo during the period of 2013 to 2016. Prof. Rady was the editor of the Physics of the Dark Universe Journal and is currently editor of the Journal of Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics. As of 2019, she was the chair of the Scientific Advisory Board of Archive. Without further ado, let us welcome Professor Lisha Verde. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, uh, lecture series. And thanks, everybody, for uh, connecting. These are uh, difficult times, but uh, you have adjusted, I see, very quickly and rapidly. Uh, and thank you for this uh, very nice introduction. So let's, uh, let's start, let's, uh, let's get going. So I want, what I want to talk about is observing the light of uh, the distant uh, universe. And uh, let's see if we take an imaginary trip away from Earth, we will, uh, you know, start uh, moving across the solar system and the sun becomes uh, uh, dimmer and dimmer. And then we'll start seeing other stars that are in our solar neighborhood. And then if we zoom out and zoom out some more, at some point uh, we'll see our, uh, our own galaxy. We live in the, in the suburb of our own galaxy. That's obviously an artistic impression. We haven't been there to take pictures from the outside. And then as you keep going away, there are more and more galaxy and so on and so forth. So why do we do that? Why do we invest you know, money, career and effort in you know, looking up at the sky? And, and my answer to this is because we are born to explore as a species and we are driven by curiosity. And there are several different ways to actually explore. These are my two twin daughters. Uh, there are people who, for which exploring means actually going somewhere since at the very beginning. And there are other people for which exploring means just experimenting and looking at things around how they work. And in our history of exploration, the humankind has considered exploring under several different points of view from Columbus, who had to go to the Americas and you know the space flight and human space flight all the way to actually remote understanding of the faraway universe with big telescopes, both on Earth, and these are uh, telescopes both uh, in, uh, in, in telescopes in Hawaii, for example, which is a very tall mountain, and Canary Island also has Hawaii in a very tall mountain, as a telescope very tall mountain, and uh, uh, Space Observatory. This is an actually cosmic microwave background experiment that was involved with as the picture of the launch, and we are all familiar with 
with the Hubble Space Telescope for, telescope, for example. So the first concept I want to get through is that we do that because we believe that the universe is comprehensible, at least to human. And it didn't have to be the case, right? Because uh, we are um, amb ambitious enough <laughs> that we believe that we can understand the universe and no other species on Earth can understand the universe. We wouldn't think that you know, a monkey or a dolphin would ask a question about you know, the entire universe. And to do that, we have to say that physics and chemistry and mathematics and this kind of discipline, as we know them and experience them here on Earth and in a lab and as we study them at school, can describe and explain the universe. Where explain means how, but not necessarily why. All right. But this is not new. So my uh, fellow countryman, Galileo Galilei, was the first to point a telescope to the sky and uh, to realize that there were connection between what you could see out there in the sky and the physics that actually uh, govern what we do here on Earth. And he gave us the scientific revolution and that gave us modern science. So what is cosmology? Cosmo cosmology is the study of the universe and as such asks some important questions like what is the universe made of? How did the universe begin? How did it evolve? How did it end up looking the way it does today? And even probably question like, how will it end? And uh, these kind of questions are tall questions, but I would argue that they are simple. And you would say, how, why are they simple? We can't really you know, model or understand how things work down here on Earth. How can we believe that we can understand how things work in the entire universe? And the answer in C is simple as follows. So we know that gravity is a very weak force. It's a very weak force compared to uh, the fundamental forces, even the electromagnetic forces, and even the strong and the weak force between the fundamental particles are much stronger than gravity. Yet all these forces act both ways. Electromagnetism, we know, is both attractive and repulsive. But gravity is always attractive. So as you go to larger and larger scales, electromagnetism cancel out, but gravity keeps adding up. And so the idea is as you go to larger and larger scale, gravity dominates and gravity, well, it's simple. So uh, thanks to that, uh, cosmology came up with a wonderful model. And it's a relatively simple model that describes the universe from more or less the beginning to today and how it evolved and all that. And this is uh, this model needs just six numbers to quote Martin Rees, who is, I'm sure needs no introduction and is based here at Cambridge. So I'm, I'm sure you know of the book. Uh, and in this model has deep fundamental link with uh, our understanding of physics at the very basic level and how the fundamental particle work. So over and over in cosmology, there is this uh, late motive of this connection between the infinitely big and the infinitely small. Well, it's not infinitely big, but it's very large and it's not infinitely small, but it's very small. And so we'll see this late motive over and over again. Never mind that the model is weird, because if I now show you what we know being the cosmic pi, that is the component of the universe, the current composition lo looks something like that. And there are small, really subdominant component. I don't want to see this down here, uh, but uh, all the matter that we really know about is down here in this 5% and everything else, it's different. And this is the current composition, the fraction evolved with time. So, so never mind that the model is weird, but it works. So we know that it all started in a Big Bang. I, even prime time televisions know that. But the issue is how, how do we know it and what do we really know? So let me see if I can tell you a little bit of a, of a story and give you a flavor. Of course, in, in, in the time given, we can't actually go into too much detail. But before I go on, let me make this remark. Cosmology is special because we can't make experiment, only observations. Despite the fact that we sell the funding agency, the idea that we do experiment, really what we can do is only observation. 
So typically we want to use the entire observable universe as a detector itself and observe this detector, but the detector is given and we can't tinker with it. In this sense, we only do observations. But this has driven a lot of experimental effort because of course, the bigger is your detector, the more you can know and the better measurement you can make. But when your detector is what you can observe of the universe, then you want to use the as much as you can see, and you want to see more and more and more. So we start from the beginning, ask for a simple explanation, and they end up telling you the history of the universe. Sorry, let's go through that. Let's start from scales. So if the solar uh, system is a coin, then the next star will be about two kilometers away. And the galaxy will be about as big as the entire Europe. So there are as many stars in a galaxy as grain of sand in a cubic meter of sand. And galaxies for cosmologists are little more than points. There are, are many galaxies in the universe as grain of sand on the surface of a beach. And there are more stars in the universe than grain of sand in the entire Earth. And here is a picture of a beach just to sort of bring home how many stars there are really out there. And that's just a, a, you know, a small uh, corner of a beach. So galaxies are uh, not uniformly distributed. Now, this uh, video was done from actual data, but uh, gluing them and, uh, and animating uh, a fly through, like if it was a video game, but where each, each uh, galaxy is actually the picture of a galaxy taken by a survey, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And so this is what we call the largest scale structure of, uh, of the universe, and there's a lot of information that we can learn from that. And uh, by the way, this was taken from, uh, from this telescope, the Sloan telescope uh, in New Mexico. It's not such a big telescope. It's uh, a little bit more than, uh, than, than two meters. But if you want to cover a lot of the sky, you know, you can't make the, the mirror too big because otherwise you only see a small fraction of the sky and it will take a lot to build uh, or serve in a very large area. And this image, it's a, a fraction of the big survey that the, the, the Sloan telescope uh, did. This is actually from, taken from the so-called the Boss survey, but uh, not interested in the name. The different, co each point is a galaxy and each, the color represents a little, the distance from us of uh, this galaxy. So sort of give you a flavor of what is uh, uh, the fabric of the largest scale structure out there. So it should be obvious from what I showed so far that most of the information we get from the universe still come from light. Light is our cosmic messenger. So the, the gravitational wave window was open in 2016 and it really like, you know, opening a new window into the universe. But still, most of the information come uh, through light. There is another concept that uh, I want to bring up before we go on, which is looking far away in space is looking back in time. Einstein told us that uh, light travel at a final speed, at a finite speed. So for example, the light we get from the sun, when we look at the sun, for example, in a sunset, uh, was emitted eight minutes ago. And then uh, when we look at the center of the galaxies, again, this is an, a galaxy similar to us. We haven't gone out of the galaxy to take a picture of ourselves from out there. Uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the rovers made it to Mars <laughs> and took picture from there, but not from outside the galaxy. And uh, we look uh, when we look at the center, uh, the galactic center, which is visible from the other hemisphere, uh, it's uh, 28,000 uh, years uh, ago. And as we go farther away, uh, Andromeda galaxy, some 2 million years ago. So when we look uh, far away in space, we look back in time. This is uh, an image of a survey that actually finished uh, in the year 2000. So it's not the latest generation survey. But if you are here, looking out at the universe here it's about 14 giga years which means 10 to the 9 uh, uh, 
number of zero here, from the Big Bang, this is 11 of those from the Big Bang. But when we look, we're doing archaeology, but uh, the archaeologist sees bones while astronomer lives, see the, the past alive and kicking. And uh, the Hubble Space Tele Telescope has taken picture of the very far away universe. So all these smudges and things are actually entire galaxies uh, out there. And I'm not going to say much more about that, but uh, it's, uh, I'm sure you've seen this. Uh, the other concept that I want to introduce is that measuring distances is difficult, but measuring velocities is easy. We know that light is a wave and a little bit like sound. And we know that when an object that emits sounds is moving towards us, we hear a higher pitch sound. And when it moves away from us, we hear a lower, speed, uh, a lower pitch sound. With the light and the wavelengths of the light, a similar thing happens. When an object that emits light moves towards us, we see the wavelengths being pushed to higher frequency. And, uh, and shorter wavelengths. When it moves away from us, we see it push to uh, longer wavelengths and lower frequencies. So longer wavelengths, we call it, it goes towards the red. And, uh, and shorter wavelengths, we say it's blue. It's because the central part of the visible is somewhere in between red and blue, somewhere in the, in the green, <laughs> so and green yellow. So that's how we call it. Why am I saying this? Uh, well, first, to see the effect, you need to go to speed or the light needs to be moving at speed that are close to the speed of light. So if you are being stopped by the police because you jump a traffic light, don't say I was moving towards the red and then it got blue shifted. I looked like green and therefore I went through because you'll get a FT fine anyway, you would have to be going at a fraction of the speed of light. So if you don't get the fine for the traffic light, you will get it for speed. And uh, it's uh, relatively easy to do because uh, we take uh, spectra of object and it's easy to take spectra of object, pass the light through a prism or to something more elaborate today than a prism. But then each element has its own fingerprint signature in the spectrum of an object and one recognize the emissions of the variable element. And if the object one is observing is moving, those lines will move with respect to how, where they are in a spectrum in the lab. So again, remember, looking far away is looking back in time. Uh, before I connect uh, wavelengths and distances, let me ask a question. This is a question that uh, it's called Olbers paradox, and it goes back to 1826, but it was around in different forms since about the 1500 or so. Why can't we see to infinity? So why is the night sky dark? Because if we could see to infinity and there was stars all the way through, then everywhere I look, I would eventually hit at the surface of a star, and therefore the night sky should be ablaze, should not be dark. So if the sky is dark, it's either because the universe is finite, or now we know light, light doesn't travel at an infinite speed, travel at a finite speed, the universe must have had a beginning. So it must not have been along forever, because otherwise we will run into the Olbers paradox. So let's go back. Remember, measuring uh, distances is difficult, but measuring uh, velocities or redshift is easy. The connection to this goes back to Edwin Hubble. So Hubble got a satellite name, the Hubble Space Telescope. So if you want to have a satellite name after you, you better do at least one very important thing. Hubble did at least two. So Hubble was observing galaxies, and, and the, these galaxies were relatively nearby. So he could measure distances some other way, albeit imprecise, but he could still have a proxy for their distances. And then they realized that the majority of galaxies was looking at, they were running away. 
Not only that, but he found a somewhat linear relation between the recession velocity of these galaxies and their distance. Now, this is the original plot that uh, Hubble published. And this is the equation he wrote. The recession velocity is related to the shift of the wavelength, which is called redshift. There's a, a speed of light in there, uh, just for making the equation consistent. It's directly proportional to the distance, and today we call this uh, the Hubble constant. Okay. Now, uh, notice that uh, this plot wouldn't fly today because uh, there's something very important missing from this plot. Error bars. But Hubble was Hubble, and that was at the beginning of the field, and we could still do a fit to some point even without the error bar. So what uh, was the conclusion of this? Well, if we believe Copernicus, and we better do, because the Copernican principle has worked uh, has served us very well, then we are not in a special location of the universe making this observation, and everybody else will be making a different observations. It must be that any other alien, if you want, sitting in any other part of the universe would have to be making the same observation. And therefore, if any other uh, little green man Hubble make the same observation, then it means that the entire universe is expanding. Now, this is a highly simplified story. As you know, in science, we always stand on the shoulder of giants. So for Hubble to be able to publish this plot and make this conclusion, he had to rely on the work of a lot of people, Henrietta Lewy, uh, Lewitt, uh, uh, Slifer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But since we have a short time, we'll just pick one hero and we keep moving. So, okay, so that's the expanding universe. Of course, you know this idea took a while to actually bet, get completely accepted by by the community, but uh, today it's uh, it's accepted. So, if uh, the universe is expanding. Let me run the movie backwards. Then in the past, it must have been much denser. When you compress something, it usually gets hot. Imagine when you pump up uh, the wheels of your bike, uh, the wheel heats up because you're compressing air in them. So the universe was dense and hot. If the universe was dense and hot in the past, it must have been emitting radiation. So, When this uh, discussion were going on, Fred Hoyle, which is another giant of uh, physics and cosmology, said as a joke, so do you think the entire universe was born out of a Big Bang? But the name stuck. In 1965, two Bell Lab engineers, here they are, Persias and Wilson, were studying radio communication with this antenna. And uh, whatever they did, they found a background noise in the radio that wouldn't go away and was uniformly distributed in the sky. And this is what we call today the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is this echo of the universe when it was hot and dense in the past. And this, uh, they received the Nobel Prize in 1978 for this, uh, for this discovery. So space is filled with this leftover heat from the Big Bang, and we call this a CMB. Now, I, the universe is not egg-shaped. This radiation is not egg-shaped. What I've done here, I've done a projection of the celestial sphere, like sometimes we do for uh, the world to, to do maps. So I'm representing a sphere in a plane. And this thing here is the emission of our own galaxy. Our galaxy also emits in the, at the radio wavelength. So by the way, a hot Big Bang, as it was a joke, it's what is needed to form the light elements. Uh, to a cosmologist, uh, the periodic table is these elements here and the rest they are called metals and they don't care about it. Because all these other elements here, they're made on stars. And so po poetically, you can say that uh, we are made of stardust. So they are made of stars. When stars explode, like, for example, supernova, all these elements get recycled and redistributed. New star form, new solar system form. And here we are, the iron in our blood comes out of there. 
But, so Pension Save Wilson saw a uniform uh, uh, emission. We know that today the universe is clumpy. We have galaxies, we have planets, we have people. Where are the seeds of the galaxies? So here they are. <laughs> this is the image of the same cosmic microwave background radiation to which uh, the, the, C, the DC signal has been subtracted. This is the emission of our own galaxies taken by the, another uh, NASA satellite, COBE. And this anisotropy here are one part in uh, 100,000. This was very interesting because the cosmologists that were looking for these uh, seeds of galaxies, this uh, initial small perturbation that then grew up the structure today, and they were expecting them at a much higher level than the one that then got seen by the COBE satellite. And it's like if there was some sort of uh, scaffolding there, that would help this structure to form if we keep believing that all we see, it's all that is there and it's all the matter as we know it today, what we call normal matter, baryonic matter, which makes up the stars and, and lights up. So we need to go back a second, a little bit again at the beginning of the 1900 when Fritz Zwicky realize that uh, uh, clusters of galaxies, this is an image of a clusters of galaxies, uh, were very strange object because the galaxies in these clusters of galaxies were moving very fast. So fast that if all the mass that was there was the mass of the galaxies themselves, those objects should have evaporated because of the uh, large motions. And so he said, there should be some more matter there, dark, because I can't see it. And all the students that when they see the picture of his wiki with this expression, they will always remember about dark matter. Um, Einstein came along at, uh, at about the same time and uh, uh, published his theory first of special relativity and then of general relativity, which is a description of gravity. What we perceive as gravity, it's a deformation of space-time. That is, stuff, matter, deform space, but in Einstein terms, we have to call it space-time. And we can summarize gravity as a phys famous physicist John Wheeler did by saying matter tells space-time how to curve and then space-time tells matter how to move. So we should interpret uh, gravity a little bit like putting a weight on a mattress. And I like uh, uh, both the guy here and the dog there being a large mass deforming the space time around it. So then, for example, if this is a star, then a planet orbits the star just because of the deformation of the space time. Uh, and so, of course, this is sensitive to all the stuff that is matter, not just what lights up. There was another information here by Vera Rubin, but this is uh, in, the, in the 60s and 70s that she said in a spiral galaxy, the ratio of dark to light matter is about a factor of 10 by looking at rotation curves of galaxies which is probably a good number for the ratio of awakening to knowledge. So there were a lot of indication about the presence of dark matter. And, and uh, then uh, later uh, we managed, this is a picture taken from the Hubble Space, Space Telescope actually, to see the effect of the deformation of the space time from the dark matter. So this is another cluster of galaxies and all these arches that you see here these are the image of the same background galaxies far away, which light has been so distorted that it's like when you look from a glass that is imperfect and you get all the images distorted, it's the same thing. And then if you figure out how much stuff you need here to generate this bending of light, it's factors of hundreds more than what you count up just by looking at what lights up. So today we know that uh, uh, if you had the glasses to see dark matter, oops, 
this are this is the distribution of galaxies that you would see and this is the underlying distribution of dark matter this is a simulation but uh, if it's gravity we know well how gravity works so we believe we can simulate that. so there is much more stuff more than a factor 100 in blue than it is in white and uh, this we believe makes up the cosmic web and this is how in every physics department around the globe halloween became the dark matter day because of the web connection so i couldn't go on without showing the picture of the person that gave us the cosmological model now standard for contribution to our understanding of the evolution of the universe discovering physical cosmology both dark matter and, and cosmic microwave background so let's go back now to the cosmic microwave background so the presence of dark matter also help us explain why those initial seeds are that small because those initial seeds are actually could grow faster than we originally imagined because there's a lot of dark matter down there which doesn't light up and add as a scaffolding that help the growth of those structures. So this uh, cosmic microwave background, uh, uh, CMB for the friends, also called primordial fireball or the echo of the Big Bang, come to us from when the universe was only 380,000 years old and today it's about 14 giga years. So why is that important? Uh, well, the universe back then was made of a hot and dense gas, so it was emitting radiation, and this is the radiation we see when we look at the CMB. It's uniform, but with tiny density and temperature ripples. But here I'm talking about ripple in a gas. So these were basically sound waves. And the, a lot of the equation that described and similar to the one for sound waves. So this has been called a cosmic symphony. This is basically like seeing sound. These are these tiny fluctuations qualitatively give rise to galaxies. And this kind of map were, were instrumental to understand and to build the standard cosmological model. So I like to make a, a, a parallel. So when uh, Fermi was trying to sell the first particle accelerators were actually to understand the basic structure of things like, you know, the protons and, and other particles was saying, look, it's like taking two grand piano, smashing them together and out of the debris that come out of the collision, we try to figure out how the instrument is made. So here we are a little bit more elegant. We are trying to listen to this sound by, we're actually visualizing sound and figure out how the instrument is made. This is not too different from when you knock on things and try to guess what material they are made of. So we're trying to guess how the universe, what, what makes up the universe by listening to this sound. Now, you can say, oh, very nice story, but, uh, you know, <laughs> who is playing the instrument? And I will say, shh. This is a too complicated question, so we'll maybe talk about it later if we have time <laughs> on that side. Okay, so here's some history of the, the measurement of the cosmic microwave background. There was Persian and Wilson, then there was the Kobe satellite. After a lot of ground-based experiment and balloon-borne experiment and effort, the next full sky map of the cosmic microwave background was produced by the WMAP satellite, and it looks something like this. Again, the emission of our own galaxy there. And uh, I like to explain why it's important to learn much more about this, uh, this fluctuation with much higher resolution uh, by remembering that this is a picture of when the universe was what we call a baby, what I call the baby universe. So if today the universe is uh, an adult, since it is almost 14 billion years old, giga years old, then when we took this picture, it was basically that same person few hours from being born. 
And this is actually the picture of uh, one of my kids <laughs> a few hours after being born. But when you see the picture at this resolution, then it's like seeing the picture like this. You can't see much. But when you see it at much higher resolution, you can tell a lot more about whatever person that is. So that's why it's important to take pictures at the higher resolution of the baby universe. So these are often called the spot, corresponding to tiny ripple in density, the seeds of the galaxy, and it's the detailed statistical property of, of this ripple that tell us a lot about the universe. So let me try to explain why. So, well, after WMAP, there, was, uh, there were a lot of, a lot of other ground-based experiments. The next satellite that also gave us a full sky map of the universe was the ESA NASA uh, Planck satellite. This is the map result uh, that was released in 2013. Uh, Planck, of course, kept uh, releasing uh, improved measurement until a couple of years ago, but uh, for the picture, this is, uh, this is enough. So how are the parameters of the standard cosmological model measured? So this animation, which is courtesy of NASA, explains, to, explains this to us. So you could see these uh, colors and this spot as a fingerprint. And then uh, one can generate many different type of universes and see when the fingers deep match, a little bit like detectives do with the fingerprints. And by that, then one can know about the component of the model, atoms, dark matter, shape, age, clumpiness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So going back to this parallelism of the evolution of a person and the evolution of the universe as i was saying if today it's a, an adult the universe what we see nearby looking far away is looking back in time until we see the baby universe down here and imagine how much more you can learn about a person if you could see a lot of picture along the life, when it's a toddler, when it's a baby, when it's a kid, when it's an adolescent, et cetera, et cetera. It's basically having a, 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 a photo book of the person. And so that's what we're trying to do by observing the, dis the light from the distant universe, we are trying to reconstruct this, uh, this photo picture. And we know that it's gravity that drives the growth of this perturbation. So here it is, we are observing the universe and we are trying to connect this, uh, these two ends. So how do we do that? Well, we don't go into equation, but let me give you an intuitive feeling how you do that. So let's imagine to look at the surface of the sea a more, an early morning where there are tiny little, lipo, uh, tiny little waves on the surface of the sea. And then there is the wind. The wind corresponds to gravity and the little waves correspond to the seed of galaxies. Now the wind keeps blowing for the entire day and now the waves keep growing and growing and growing until by the end of the day they are so big that you can surf on them. Now, of course, if you know the strengths of the wind, that is, I know gravity, then you can learn a lot about the composition of the sea, because if the sea was made of honey or was made of molasses, then it wouldn't grow wave the same way as if it's made of water. And so in a very similar way, that's what large scale structure study of the universe are trying to do with, of course, statistical, statistical tools. And that's what, you know, a survey telescope like this try to do by providing pictures like that. You can imagine this as being waves which are almost ready for you to surf on, basically. So let me take one step back. Remember Einstein told told us that the mass bend the space time. He also told us E equal MC square. I put it there just because it's in t-shirts, but not because it's particularly relevant here. And then Newton can say, wasn't mass responsible for gravity? And then Einstein says, Shh, it's too complicated, I'll explain you later. So uh, Einstein say that if mass bends space-time, then space-time can have different geometry. But if I look at the universe as a whole, then there are only three possibilities there. It's an open universe if I don't have to enough stuff. 
and it looks like uh, any, you know, the, the, the geometry looks a little bit like a horse saddle. If I have too much stuff in there, it looks like a closed universe, it looks a little bit like the surface of a sphere. And if I had just the right amount, it becomes a flat geometry. And fate, the geometry, history, and fate of the universe are all related. So to give you an intuitive feeling of what open, flat, and closed means is that if I have an alien somewhere, that uh, um, fires uh, two par parallel uh, laser beam of, beam of death or something like that. In an open universe, these two parallel beam will diverge. In a closed universe, well, the alien may want to move away from where he is or she is because it will be hit in the back. In this case, no alien was armed because he's got uh, uh, a shield in his back, but that's the idea. And in the case in between, in the case that is just right, the two beam will go on parallel forever. So you can already see the key here to measure the geometry. You want to draw as big a triangle as you can and then check if the angle inside the triangle sum to uh, 180, less than 180 or more than 180 degrees. And so this is exactly what... Uh, cosmologists have been doing by looking at the radiation from the cosmic microwave background because that's the biggest triangle you can ever make. You go from here to as far away as you can see and measure something there and the other side is a structure at the uh, surface of the cosmic microwave background. So that's the thing. And then imagine that this is a representation of, uh, of the space-time. One look back at a patch of this cosmic microwave background radiation. And those would look very different depending on, on the geometry, whether it's uh, flat, closed, or open. And it turns out that, uh, well, it looks pretty much consistent with the central case, with having a, a flat geometry. But it's the amount of stuff that determines its geometry. And we know that there is a lot of dark matter out there. So let's, let's do the calculation. The galaxy distribution, gravitational lensing, Vera Rubin calculation, and Zwicky tell us that there is a lot of dark matter out there, yes, but still not enough to make the universe flat. Well, so the cosmic microwave background tells us the universe is flat. Einstein tells us that the stuff bends space-time and you need enough stuff to make it flat. Uh, we don't find enough of that stuff. And there was also an nagging problem there what uh, the age of the universe seems to be not enough uh, to get you from here to here. So somebody must be mistaken. Let's do a step back and let's add another piece of information. Um, Einstein theory of uh, relativity predicts that the universe is not stable. It's either expanding or contracting. Maybe expanding, but Einstein didn't like that. So he added a term to his equation, a fudge factor, which could be interpreted as the energy of empty space to make the universe static. And he was happy with that. And then later, later Hubble comes along and find the Hubble law and expand the universe. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, Einstein goes, Dah. this is not uh, finished here because we want to do like Hubble again. We kept on going as a community to do the Hubble law farther and farther and farther away. Now, to do it farther and farther away, you need very luminous objects to see as far as possible. And thank goodness we have those objects that are also like a standard candle. They are more or less the same uh, brightness, intrinsic brightness when they explode. And these are called supernovae. And the cool thing of supernovae is that you can even see them by naked eye, naked eye on a, or, or some of them if they are nearby or with a very a relatively tiny telescope, even an amateur telescope. So can, do you have sharp eyes to see a supernova here? This is the Whirlpool galaxy. There it is. This object has our standard candle. And so 
since you know how bright it is out of basic uh, uh, stellar physics or because you've calibrated them, then and you can see them very, very far away because for for a few hours or a day, a supernova can be as luminous as this entire galaxy. So imagine how bright is that. Then one can do a map of uh, distance versus recession velocity at very large distances, and one can map the expansion history of the universe. So this is what this guy did. And in 1998, they went through over and over and over their calculation and the expansion. It's not slowing down, it's accelerating. Now, this was a big surprise because gravity is an attractive force, right? If I take anything and I try to throw it out, imagine that this, uh, my throwing something up is similar to making the universe expand in the original Big Bang expansion. Then I expect this thing that I throw up to come back down, right? Unless I send something up which at, at, the, at the escape speed and you know end up in orbit or who knows where, I still expect that as the object goes up, it will slow down, not accelerate. So if you apply this to the entire universe, if you expect this function to slow down, not to accelerate. Well, it turns out that the term that uh, Einstein added as the energy of the vacuum would explain this observation. So gravity pull things together, dark energy, which is this thing that got added, pushes the galaxies apart. And what it is, is associated to nothing. When I told you that the model was weird, I was not uh, exaggerating. And uh, this got uh, those people the Nobel Prize in 2011 for the discovery of the accelerating universe. So we and only chemistry are a small minority of the universe. And about, uh, you know, a bit more than a quarter of it is dark matter, which we don't know what it is, but it's at least, it's at least this matter. And maybe at some point in the standard model of the particle, somebody will find something that behaves like the dark matter. But the dark energy, well, it's dark energy, but, you know, we don't really know what it is. We can see it's, its effect only at the very largest scales of the universe. So what is dark energy? Now, this is the question that is in the front line of every cosmologist since, uh, you know, the early 2000s. This question may not be unrelated, however, to the question of who plays the instrument. Because, and what power the Big Bang? Because it all involves an accelerated expansion. And an accelerated expansion is probably driven by something which is not too dissimilar from something that maybe you've heard about because it was another Nobel Prize recently, the Higgs. So let me go back to who plays the instrument. Uh, all we have found so far in cosmology leaves a major open question. So why is the expansion of the universe accelerated? Why is the primordial universe so homogeneous? Who put the seeds of the galaxies there? The cool thing is that the primordial universe is a lab that reaches much higher energy than, say, the LHC or any other lab that we could ever build on Earth. And understanding the origin of the universe means understanding physics as those energy. And there are traces of this physics out there brought to us, again, by cosmic light, which is our messenger. Also, probably also by gravitational wave, but we don't have enough uh, statistic of those just uh, yet yeah, to go there. So who plays the instrument? If I have another uh, few minutes, let me try to say something about what the status of what we think it could be who plays the instrument. So I call it a detective story that is still unsolved because um, our hypothesis, the hypothesis is that uh, there was an, uh, an, uh, an accelerated expansion so brief some 0, 0, 0034 0, 1 second after the Big Bang, and not even light could keep up. And it lasted some 0 0.0320 seconds. Again, whatever that was, was happening when the universe was extremely, extremely small. So it's something that has to do with the infinitely small and yet created something of which we see the signature on scales that are very, very, very large. So that's 
again this uh, connection. And uh, one of the key that uh, helps us understand that, that uh, this is what may be going on goes back to the cosmic symphony. And I would like to give you an intuitive explanation of what I mean by cosmic symphony. Let's uh, consider a graphic equalizer. I think uh, if some of you are uh, interested in music, will know what, uh, what that means. So let me take a music that is high in acute. So you see the acute high frequency is high and the grave is low. And it will sound something like this. You can hear it's high in acute sound. There's a lot of violins there. There could be a music, a music that is high in graves. Or there could be a well-balanced music when, you know, more or less you have the same power at all frequencies. Hi, Professor um, Perley. Yes. I think we can't really hear the sound, but ah, I think that's okay. Let me... No, I don't think the, the sound's coming in again. Maybe we we'll, maybe we we'll just um skip this first. Uh Sorry, we, we can't hear you. Um, you might need to put back your microphone. Um, we still can't hear you. Um, can you try again? Is, is it a setting that's on your computer? So if, if anyone can hear um Professor Birdie, please let me know. So if I'm if so I'm no I'm not it's not on my side. Okay, I've, I've muted you. Uh, maybe if you try unmuting yourself. I, I can't unmute you. Uh, mm. Do you want to try logging out and logging back in again? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, seems like we have, we have a bit of a problem here. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Now I can't hear you, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll keep talking and then we sort it out later, oh. okay? Okay, yes. Um, 
Yeah, let's do that. Right. Um, would you like to share it, your screen back again? Okay. Okay. So, um, so, so, so this uh, uh, early accelerated dysfunction predicts a cosmic history made uh, in symphony made of uh, music well balanced, but slightly high in grave tones by a small amount. And this is exactly what the Planck satellite heard. Now, I don't know if my microphone is going to work or not, or if I'm going to kill it all over again. But here I have the cosmic symphony transform from frequency in a map into frequency in the sounds. And then the frequency is increased by you know a big factor so it can be heard. Shall we try? Let's see. Could you hear that? I don't well, think you can hear that. Um, I'm not no, sure if you okay. can hear me. All right. Uh, well, OK. So who plays the instrument? It implies an accelerated expansion in the first few seconds after the Big Bang, and which is called inflation, and possibly powered by something similar, in quote, because it's the, the similarity are uh, to the Higgs, but not the professor, the field. So something like uh, a scalar field pervading the everything, the empty space, and the only scalar field that we have actually seen so far is the Higgs field. That's why it's similar. There you go, another one of these. OK, so I hope I convince you that uh, despite the fact that the model uh, that we have, it's bizarre, uh, we can do precision tests of fundamental physics with cosmological data by looking up at the sky because of this deep connection between uh, the standard model of the particles and the standard model of cosmology, even though the standard model of cosmology arrive a few decades later than the standard model of the particle, but the two are informing each other also about possible uh, missing pieces. And uh, today, understanding the accelerated expansion is an effort of the entire community, and basically the vast majority of cosmologists in one way or another are interested in that. And there is a huge effort going on, both of experiment on the ground and uh, uh, planned experiment uh, in space. And uh, of course, it's, uh, it's not cheap, but these are big questions. And uh, I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Verdi, for your insightful now, cosmology talk. Very... Not sure if you can hear me. Um, maybe let's try to settle the um, mic first. Hey, could you see um, the chat? Hi, can you can you hear me now? Um, no. I don't no. know what happened before, but uh, somebody mute themselves and unmute themselves and I could hear you after that. Uh, so you you can't hear me now. <laughs> can you try? Uh no. Can you type your questions? <laughs> Okay. Um, right. For so so for this Q and A, could if if you have a question, do you mind typing it on the chat um, so that Professor Verde can see the question? Because currently, um, I think we're having some technical difficulties. My, my sincere apologies for that.
So um, maybe I'll just kick off with the first question. Okay, there, there is a question by Laura M. <laughs> so, Laura, can you hear me? Okay, so, uh, oh, I see. Okay, excellent. Uh, do you think space is scary? Well, for human going to space, I think it's scary. We are not built for actually being in space. So I will be really scared, very curious, but also very scared to go into space. Uh, on the other hand, observing it quietly from down here, I find it fascinating and not scary at all. I don't know if this answers your question. So let me read the next question. Haha, <laughs> excellent. As the universe expands, the oldest galaxies are the most distant that are traveling away from us at the greatest velocity. At some point, the most distant galaxies might reach or exceed the speed of light and thus will no longer be visible to us. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, well, not really, because what Abel found was a linear law that applies for a relatively nearby object. If you want to apply the Hubble law for objects that are very far away and therefore where their velocity, if you were to apply the Hubble law as it is inversely, will give you a, a recession velocity bigger than the speed of light. And no, it's, uh, it's, it's not that. There are corrections and, and, and nothing is really going far, uh, farther than the speed of light and therefore is not visible. However, however, there are several considerations to do here. One consideration is that the original interpretation stuff is moving away is not fully correct. Stuff is not really moving and running away through space-time. It's space-time that is expanding. So it's not that the galaxies are moving faster than light. They themselves are moving through space-time at their velocity, which is, you know, maybe a few thousand kilometers per second, but it's nothing like the speed of light. It's the space-time in between that expands, but nothing really moves faster than the speed of light. So, yes, this brings us to the concept, which we couldn't really go through in detail at, in, a, in a presentation at this level, of cosmological horizon. And yes, in principle, if the uh, accelerated expansion of the universe keeps going, eventually there will be objects that will were visible yesterday and will not be visible tomorrow anymore. No, not the meaning yesterday and tomorrow like today, but at some point in the future because of this accelerated expansion. If it is accelerated, yes, eventually the light can't keep up. If you estimate the age of the universe is based on the distance of the most distant galaxy, we can see as the universe is actually older than this universe and there is a way of measuring how much older. Okay, so uh, there are several ways to measure how old is the universe. So within, within the standard model of cosmology, since you have a model of uh, the entire history of the universe and the entire expansion history of the universe, and there are only six parameters of that model, the model you nail down the relevant parameter of the model that gives you an age of the universe. This is an indirect measurement. You measure the parameter of the model, and this implies that that's the age of the universe. Uh, direct measurement of the age of the universe uh, can be obtained by just looking at the oldest objects that are out there in the universe. And, uh, for example, uh, even nearby we have a sort of fossil uh, of stars that were formed very, very early in the life of the universe. These are globular clusters that are even around our own galaxy. A lot of galaxies have globular clusters around them. And it turns out that the age of the stars in the globular, in the oldest globular cluster is not too far away from what we believe is the age of the universe. And since these stars were formed very early on, and there's no much time between when they were born and the Big Bang, and it's big numbers anyway, it gives you 
a, a good handle on the age of the universe. But the, this is the direct measurement. The indirect measurement via the model actually gives you a much smaller error bar, but it's not, but it's something else. It's a different flavor. Um, uh, as the density of the universe changes, does the space curvature change? Oh, very good question. Okay, so um, the, the, the density of the universe that uh, tell you what the... So, yes, as the density of the universe changes, this, the amount of space curvature changes, but you can't flip between a closed universe, a flat universe, and an open universe just by expanding. So that's why uh, I summarize everything and swipe it under the carpet and say that Einstein told us that there are only three possible geometries, okay? <laughs> but uh, uh, from place to place, the curvature of the universe, yes, of course, it can change. If you, you know, if you concentrate a lot of mass by exploding a stars or something, that will change the curvature of the universe around there. Or, you know, by accreting stuff into a very massive central object in a galaxy or something like that. Yes, of course, you change the, the curvature of, of space, but that's the local curvature. The global one that tells you the geometry, that you can change. That depends on the stuff that it's in there, basically. Uh, do you think that one day we will be able to detect dark energy and dark matter, or if there are theoretical reasons why that won't be possible? Uh, well, I really hope that one day we will be able to detect dark matter and dark energy. We have seen its effects on the evolution of the universe and the growth of structure, etc. I don't know if we will ever be able to detect it in science that, you know, build it in the lab. That's probably not possible, but we'll probably be able to know better what it is and gives us some indication about what are the bits that are missing in our standard model for you know, the way the universe works. So, but there's no really theoretical reason why that won't be possible. However, it may be that um, that uh, it costs too much, <laughs> and then it won't be possible because you know we can't get there, or because uh, the signature that it produces maybe is too little for our experiment to actually be able to detect it. But there is uh, no theoretical reason to say it's not possible. So you can put yourself in some corner of parameter space that tells you there's too much noise, you won't be able to detect some property of dark matter, but nobody wants to see that because there's still a lot more that can be done. Uh, light has taught us many wonderful things about our universe, uh, but there is far future for light-based astronomy. Yes, of course. For example, the observation of virus and neutrino and gravitational wave is now a reality. Uh, yes, yes, but uh, we that's really good. Now, um, observing uh, the the universe in neutrinos, that's going to be, we observe the sun in neutrinos, but there are a lot of neutrinos from the sun and it took us a huge effort and the sun is very nearby. So as you move away from the solar neighborhood, what dominates the neutrino that you can see if you are floating in space is what is called the cosmic neutrino background. And detecting that, uh, well, there are people that, are you know, thinking of experiment to detect that and uh, it will be wonderful but it's not around the corner and for gravitational waves I think it's nicely complementary to what we can now do with light based and it will be I, I again another new window opening if we could do like a cross correlation between mapping gravitational waves and map in light say so I think it offers a lot of possibility um yes uh, 
So I think uh, we'll keep on going with the light based for a very long time. <laughs> uh, dark matter. It seems an unsatisf an unsatisfactory hypothesis. How seriously do you take the alternative models, such as the suggestion that the observation of peculiarity can be explained by an appreciated feature of gravity? Uh, very good question. So we have been looking for the dark matter as a particle because it's one of the things that. Uh, uh, simplicity and Occam razors, etc., will tell you that should be there. Uh, we know that in the standard model, particle physics is not complete. You need some asymmetry, and maybe there's another particle there. Can this particle be the particle that then behaves like dark matter or something like that? You see, there's a lot of uh, uh, ground to, uh, to to explore there and we know what the property of the dark matter needs to be it needs to be something that does not interact with baryon and does not really interact electromagnetically and if it interact with itself it needs to be relatively weak and things like that uh, so um, we can say it's not a particle which you know for a cosmologist is fine it's just say as long as whatever it is it's uh, behave like called dark matter and doesn't really interact and it's dark that is it, 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 it you can see it because of its gravitational effect then a cosmologist would be would be fine <laughs> so there are alternative models that have been suggested that says let's modify gravity but now we have to modify gravity in two different ways. We have to modify it on small scales to behave like dark matter, and then we have to modify it on large scales to behave like dark energy. Do you see that we are now starting to add a lot of epicycles? If we could have some reasonable thing that says I both behave like dark matter at some small scale and dark energy on large scale, Fine, but we know that gravity, as we know it, work like you know Einstein gave us work in a whole sort of regime. It works in the solar system. We have GPS; they work well, and things like that. We have gravitational waves; it works very well. Throwing that out of the window, I don't think it's the case. So I wouldn't say that we should not try to explore this direction. But if we have to have a simple model with the minimum number of parameters that explains all the observation, then that's the model that has something like that. Uh, do you think it's possible to add an hypothetical particle to account for dark energy? Uh, so, yeah, excellent question. So a dark energy needs to be something that does not fall under gravity like mass, but that behave in a different way. We need to be something that has negative pressure, which is not anything that we have uh, seen much. So the only thing that uh, we have seen before that can work like dark energy is the famous Einstein cosmological constant. We could tweak that around and make it not constant, but we don't have much leeway if we want to keep explaining the observation. So it has to be something that behaves like energy and it has to be something that a large scale behave repulsively rather than in an attractive way. So, um, yeah, particles probably doesn't ma much. <laughs> Go gravity, I like that. How do I think the universe made end? Uh, excellent question. So first of all, uh, I don't think any of us has any chance to see how the universe may end because if it ends, it ends so much into the future that uh, we should be relaxing now. Uh, so if the standard cosmological model is the way it appears to be now with a dark energy, which is very close to a cosmological constant and with the uh, 
parameter of the model as they are. Chances are that the universe will keep expanding forever. Uh, the objects uh, that uh, are gravitationally bound with us will always be in our horizon. Objects that are not necessarily gravitationally bound with us, maybe at some point will escape from our horizon. We, we although we won't be here, won't be able to, to see them. So stars will form, uh, galaxy will form all the stars they can. Those stars will eventually burn out and uh, it will end basically in a cold death, so to speak. However, if dark energy is a little bit different from a cosmological constant, there are more interesting ways to make the universe end. One particular way which has captured the attention of uh, many people in the press a few years ago was that if you make this uh, dark energy much more powerful than the standard cosmological constant. At some point, you can't do it. Uh, you can't play too much with the observations. But we have observation only until today, so you can, you know, make this thing change into the future. And at some point, it changes in time. It becomes much more powerful, and it start making an accelerated expansion, much more powerful, and much faster than the one we are seeing now. And we keep it going like this. Eventually, it can come to a point, if you tweak the parameters, that uh, it start uh, making expand also things that were previously gravitationally bound. And at some point, if you keep tweaking the parameter, it may make explode even things that are, you know, bound together by electromagnetism. And this is called the big rip scenario. So instead of uh, ending the universe in a in a cold uh, desert, we may end up with a big grip. But again, this is speculative, and you have to tweak the, para the, the, the you have to go away from the standard model, tweak what makes up the, the dark energy, but it's entertaining. Uh, what do I believe is at the edge of the universe? A pot of gold? <laughs> Uh, no, so uh, it depends what you mean by the edge, whether by edge you mean the horizon of the visible universe, because we there is an horizon to the visible universe, and that would be the edge of, of the universe. But the universe itself, if by universe to, you mean all the space-time, then it can't talk about the edge, because you can't really talk about anything else that is not in the universe. Unless you go into this theory of the multi-universes and then the different universes may collide with other universes. But again, we haven't seen any signature of that. And therefore, it would be cool though to see that. <laughs> I don't know if this answers your question, Joss. Okay, I am so sorry that uh, this thing of the of the sound did not work out so well, but I hope you could follow most of it. Okay, um, I, I, I don't think you can you hear. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So thank you so much for for your insightful talk on on, on cosmology and and the origins of the universe and, and the whole history of how how we discovered what we now know about. The known universe. Um, it, it was really interesting, and um, apologies for for the minor technical difficulties halfway through. Um, I don't. I think it was. I think everyone here enjoyed the talk overall, um, despite it. So thank you so much for joining thank us, you. and and thank you to uh, members of the audience who are still here right now for for attending. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs>